there is one little um, caveat that I want to mention. Um, so if you're familiar with the labor uh, macro literature, so um, the literature that uses uh, matching models to study um, the labor market, you might know that uh, so the, the main paper that introduced a wage rigidity in the macro labor literature was uh, Hall 2005. And uh, what Hall showed is that uh, with rigid wages, uh, there are um, significant uh, fluctuations in unemployment. In response to um, in response to productivity shocks. So that was a very important, uh, that was a very important finding and it was a, a, a first and uh, I think the most realistic um, resolution to the Scheimer puzzle. So that was a way to resolve the Schirmer puzzle to show that actually in, in matching model, uh, so Schirmer showed that in matching model with Nash bargaining, you didn't have really any significant fluctuations in unemployment, <coughs> which of course is a problem if you have a model that you want to use to study business cycles in which of course unemployment in reality fluctuates a lot. Hall showed that with rigid wages, you could actually get significant fluctuation um, in unemployment. And furthermore, Hall showed that um, so because wages were decided in situation of bilateral monopoly, it was totally legitimate to assume that uh, wages were rigid, that this wouldn't create um, bilateral inefficiencies. However, so one caveat that Hall say, uh, mentioned is that, you know, your wage couldn't be, your rigid wage couldn't be just anywhere. Um, so he showed that Rigid wages uh, are uh, theoretically um, legitimate. Um, they you know, do not create any um, bilateral inefficiencies, which, you know, as we've discussed before, would be um, problematic because these are inefficiencies that can be uh, address with just a bit of cooperation between the two parties. Um, and that was a typical criticism of rigid wages. So disequilibrium literature, but this criticism that, for instance, Barrow raised is not valid here in a matching model. Uh, but, so, uh, but uh, you can't have any rigid wage. Uh, so what Hall showed is that the rigid wage must remain Uh, within a fairly narrow band. And by that, I mean that uh, your wedge must always be between a lower bound and an upper bound. And, um, you know, the lower bound and the upper bound, the gap is not necessarily, uh, the gap is not necessarily very large. And so, I, you know, here when I presented the uh, model of Slack, I never mentioned such a band. I just said we can have any price norm we want. You know, any price that's positive can be uh, can be a price norm. There is no restriction that we impose here. And furthermore, we also showed that for any price norm, you will always have a surplus, an aggregate surplus when the seller and the buyer meet. But even more, we showed that there would always be a positive surplus for the seller, positive surplus for the buyer, so that both buyer and seller would always be happy to transact at that price norm. Uh, and so it's kind of, it seems inconsistent that in our model, the price norm can be anything, whereas in, in Hall's model, there was this 
uh, this wedge band in which wedges had to fall. And so w w why is this difference coming from? How come we can have such, you know, uh, so much more freedom in setting our price? And the answer is very simple. Um, the reason why Hall had to impose uh, a wedge band is because the model that Hall used was very special. And in particular, it was completely linear. The product, you know, the production function was linear and, um, you know, the utility functions were linear. And so that really restricted uh, the set of wedges that were acceptable. Whereas in our model, as we've seen, the utility function, uh, you know, is just a CDS utility function. So it's concave and, you know, it satisfies in other conditions. And just because of that, this just more general um, utility function, which in particular means that when we have very little consumption, the marginal utilities go to infinity, that will allow us to have uh, to, to allow for any uh, any price band. Um, so that's, that's something I wanted to point out. It's so the existence of this price of this wedge band in all's paper is not something that uh, is somehow you know due to the uh, matching framework. It's just due to the very specific linear assumptions that Hall made, and which uh, these linear assumptions are very often made in the matching literature, but they are very restrictive. They create this wedge band here, and they also have other problematic implications. But this linearity, so it's quite costly, actually. But if you use just more general and standard uh, concave functions, in particular functions that, satis that satisfy in other conditions, you're not going to have to impose price bands or wedge bands. You can have any price you want. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so let me summarize this. So the wedge band exists because <coughs> of linearity of the model. So essentially, uh, what happens is that your wedge has to always be less than the marginal product of labor, and it has to be more than the marginal rate of substitution for household, but that marginal rate of substitution, this is typically, uh, you know, that's something that we typically call uh, the matching model, which is kind of your outside option. Your, uh, you can think of it as uh, you can think of this as a value of home production. But then the marginal product of labor, if you have a linear model, in particular a linear production function, that's just a, that's just your productivity. And so you can see basically your wedge is stuck between your you know value of home production and maybe also value so marginal rate of substitution between uh, leisure and consumption so this can be value of leisure value of home production but so this means that your wedge is always stuck between z and a and the gap between these two things may not be very large uh, okay but here's the key thing so <clears throat> the equivalent in the model of SAC, in our macro model of SAC, what would that be? So basically for us, we'll have the wedge, we'll have to be less, not than the, uh, sorry, here we're talking about prices. So the price um, would have to be less than what was well, the marginal utility of consumption. And it would have to be more, so it have to be sufficient to attract uh, people to work. So, you know, this is also, it has to be more than, say, the marginal rate of substitution between um, leisure and consumption. But in our model, this we've just assumed to be zero. And why is that? It's because, uh, you know, people who are in, the sh in their shop waiting for customers, uh, they can't go anywhere, right? They're in the shop and they have to be, you know, if you're a hairdresser and you're waiting for customers to come to get a haircut, you've got to be in your shop. There's nothing else you can do. You can't go home and, um, you know, do some home production or watch TV because, you know, then the whole thing breaks down. So this is zero. This is because um, sellers must remain in shop to sell. So, and this is, you know, like a, a legitimate assumption. Um, 
when firms have to, firms have to keep you know if you have a restaurant and if you want to be able to serve customers you need to have waiters that are waiting for the customers even if nobody is around uh, so that's the whole nature of the matching process so we have zero on one side but then the marginal utility of consumption because we have uh, a cs utility function The marginal utility of consumption is going to go to plus infinity when uh, C goes to zero. <coughs> this is just because the CES function satisfies in other conditions. Uh, <coughs> so if you have a price that's very high, of course, it means that they, they, you know um, you won't have that many transactions, but it means that consumption will be very low, and so the marginal utility of consumption, you know, can can you know can be extremely high. So basically, for any price, household, you know, if the price is very high, well, households are not going to consume all that much. But when they reduce their consumption, the marginal utility goes up, and at some point, the marginal utility is going to be above the price, and household will be happy to buy whatever quantity, uh, whatever quantity they want, uh, such that their marginal utility is high enough you know, to pay for the price plus the matching cost, okay? Uh, so that's the key thing is that your band becomes infinite because as price goes up, consumption reduces, the marginal utility is always going to, uh, to go up. And the same would be true, you know, if we were thinking about, as, as we'll do later, having a separate product market and labor market. On the product market, what matters is marginal utility. On the labor market, what matters is marginal product of labor. But if you have a concave production function, your marginal product of labor also goes to infinity when a labor goes to zero. So it means you can accommodate any wage. The wage is very high. You won't have many workers, but they'll be extremely productive because the marginal productivity um, is going to go to infinity. Um, so here, you know, because we have this in other conditions that are satisfied and we have a concave uh, model instead of a linear model, uh, we can have basically any price norm we want. Um, so basically what we see here is that <clears throat> When C go to zero, <coughs> the price band becomes infinitely wide. So we don't, you know, we don't have this restriction from um, Hall's paper that your wage or price is always in a narrow band here. And this is going to be true in any concave uh, model. And essentially, that satisfies uh, in other conditions. 